Hello, my, fr my friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church, just right down the street, about a uh, half quarter of a mile, I'd say. And uh, I come out here this afternoon to preach to you the gospel of grace, the good news of Jesus Christ. I come out here to exalt the grace of God in salvation, to preach to you concerning the Savior. I come here to warn you of the wrath of God which is to come upon the wicked, which will soon engulf the adversaries. I come here to warn you about the day of judgment, the day in which God will judge this world in righteousness. And friends, He will send souls to hell and He will bring His people to heaven. And friends, I don't want you to go to hell in your sins. I don't want you to die in your sins. I want you to be reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. Right now, you're either the friend of God or you're the enemy of God. You're either a child of God or you're the child of the devil. And friends, I, I truly desire that you would become children of God, born from above by the grace of God and for the glory of God. And the text of Scripture that I would like to consider this afternoon is out of the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 2, in verse 14, and Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written on their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternatively accusing or else defending them. And this text speaks to the reality that God has given all mankind an inherent knowledge of His righteousness, of His holy law, that He has implanted within people a knowledge of right and of wrong. And as we're going to see in a few minutes, mankind repeatedly chooses to do wrong, chooses to do wickedness, chooses to do evil, and therefore they know it because they know what is right, but they choose what is wrong. And by that... They are guilty. We all are guilty and deserve hell for our sins. Yet God sent His Son Jesus into the world to save sinners. And it is this Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, the biblical Christ, that I seek to exalt this afternoon by the grace of God and for the glory of God. Friends, your soul is an important thing. For once it is lost, it cannot be regained. And so I plead with you in the words of the Apostle Paul, be reconciled to God through His Son, Jesus Christ. And that way of reconciliation is only through the cross of Jesus Christ. And it is that which I seek to make known to you this afternoon, and which we will consider in a few moments. But before we do, I want to consider the context here of Romans 2, and what Paul is, is, is getting at in this chapter. What's the main argument he is presenting here? Well, in chapter 2 of Romans, to put it shortly, to put it simply, Paul is, is calling out the religious people of his day, pointing out to them their sin before God. He is showing them that just because they have performed in some religious way and have so-called good deeds, that they themselves will make it into heaven. But Paul shows them that, no, they are in great need of salvation just as much as the pagan is in great need of salvation. Whether you have gone to church most of your life or have never stepped into a church, you both likewise are in need of salvation through Jesus Christ. That is why Paul actually says in verse 1 of chapter 2, he says, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Now he's not here condemning judging altogether, but he is simply pointing out to them the fact that they were judging the pagan for doing evil things, but they themselves had sin upon their accounts. Something that they were not willing to recognize. See, the Bible says if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. We have become self-deluded. Friends, do not think so highly of yourselves. We ought to think very little of ourselves but we, because we are truly nothing. There is nothing good inherently in us. We are evil and perverse and wicked. And we deserve the harshest treatment from God for our sin.
And so that is the main argument Paul puts forward in Romans 2, is that the religious is in need of salvation. And toward the end of the chapter, or toward the midway through the chapter, excuse me, he starts discussing the law of God as God's measure, as God's standard of judgment. As that which God judges the world by. And that's key to our understanding of salvation and ultimately of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We must come to grasp and see that we have broken that very law of God so that we can see that Christ has fulfilled it on our behalf and has died to save us from its curse. And so he begins in verse 14 by saying, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having a law are a law to themselves. Simply put, what he is saying here in Romans chapter 2 is that it does not matter whether you have heard of the law of God or not, whether you have heard the gospel or not. You have guilt before God. You know what is right. You know what is wrong. But you act in contradiction to that which you know to be right. That all people have an inherent knowledge of God's righteousness, of God's justice, and what is right and what is wrong. That's clearly put forth there in verse 14. And then in verse 15, listen to what he says. He says, In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. God has written His holy law upon our hearts. In a general sense, He has done it to all people that none are without excuse. And then it says, their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So what this is clearly saying is that the conscience bears witness with this truth and with this reality and it accuses or defends us. And herein we find the fact that no one's conscience truly defends them. For we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, as Romans chapter 3, the very next chapter, clearly speaks to. We have all sinned against God. We deserve punishment for our sin. And our conscience bear witness to that. Our consciences bear witness to that reality that we ourselves have sinned against God. That is why people have guilty consciences. Because they know that they have sinned against God. He even continues in verse 16 to complete the sentence. He says, On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. Now, who is this God, we ask ourselves? Well, He is the holy and righteous God of Israel. He is the God of glory. The God who has created all things for His glory and for His purposes. He is just, as we clearly see there in Romans 2, and holy, gracious, and compassionate. God is love, yes. Listen to what Nahum chapter 1 says. Verse 2, it says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries, and He reserves wrath for His enemies. These things are indeed true, friends, concerning God. God is so holy. In fact, the Scriptures say He dwells in unapproachable light, and no one in their sin can stand before His presence. And so we are alienated and separated from this great God. And we know this because it is put forth in His law, His standard of morality, His holiness, is further explained to us in His holy law. It's shown, it's put on display for us to see 
For in the law of God, the Ten Commandments, God says you shall not lie, or steal, or murder. God says those things because He Himself is not a liar, or a thief, or a murderer. And we ourselves, when we do those things, are acting in contradiction to the character of God. But oh, my friends, I need not even ask you. Your conscience testifies that you have broken these commands, that you have broken the law of God, that I myself have broken the law of God, that because of our sin, we have offended God, and we deserve judgment. We deserve punishment for our sin against Him. And this judgment, this punishment of, uh, for sin, is spoken of all across the Holy Scriptures. In both the Old and the New Testaments. And it is simply the wrath of God against us. And more specifically put, it is hell. Hell is the place for sinners. Hell is the place where God sends the wicked for their sins. And it is a place where God unleashes His wrath against the evildoer and against the perverse. That's why in Matthew 25, 46, Jesus said this concerning the wicked, These will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The problem is, is there is not one righteous, there's not even one. And so we are all condemned to the place of eternal punishment. The place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. The place of outer darkness for the enemies of God. We are completely without hope in and of ourselves. Before the holy God of glory, we stand condemned. You stand condemned, my friends, if you have not believed upon the name of the Son of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus described in that same chapter, in Matthew 25, just a few verses back in verse 41, He said this concerning hell. He says, Then He will say to those on His left, Depart from Me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire, which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. Oh, dear friends, do not lose your soul. Do not perish in hell for your sins. I want you to be saved. Flee to Christ. Flee to the Lord Jesus Christ for eternal salvation. He is able and He is willing to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him. For He is a sufficient Savior. The Sovereign Lord who reigns over the universe as the King of glory. And so we are truly without hope. Having broken the law, we are condemned to hell by default. We are, to the fullest extent, hopeless. However, as Galatians 4.4 4 tells us, when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son, born of a virgin, born under the law. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That is the Gospel message, that Jesus saves sinners. Jesus came into the world and fulfilled the law of God on behalf of the people of God. He fulfilled every command that we have broken. And then, He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God. And He was beat and whipped and spat upon and dealt treacherously with by the children of men, by filthy sinners. And He was nailed to the cross. And there on that cross, He satisfied the wrath of God. The wrath of the Father was spent on His Son. Jesus Christ died to purchase salvation for His people. In fact, in the book of Matthew, in Matthew chapter 3, the angel who appeared to Joseph in a dream said in verse 21, he said, concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, She will bear a son, and you shall call His name Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. 
Christ came to save His people from their sins. To save them from the wrath which is to come. On that cross, the wrath of the Father was unleashed upon His Son. That is why Isaiah 53.10 says, It pleased the Lord to crush Him. And after three days in the tomb, He was raised again to life. The Father rose Him up as the public display that He had received His atoning sacrifice at the cross as sufficient payment for the sins of God's people. The resurrection of Jesus Christ has great significance. And after 40 days of further ministry, Christ, Jesus Christ, was exalted into heaven. He was received into glory. And He sat down at the right hand of majesty on high, having completed the work of salvation once for all. He is seated there now in heaven, and He reigns as King of the universe, as the Lord of glory. The Bible says He is high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. That He lives to make intercession for those who draw near to God through Him. Titus 3 puts it this way in verse 4, But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior. My friends, Jesus Christ is the perfect manifestation of the grace of God and the kindness of God towards sinners. And so as Mark 1 says, the call of the Gospel is that you must repent. You must flee from your sins and flee to the Savior, Jesus Christ. You must turn to Him for eternal life. You must be saved through Him. You must believe. That is the second thing. Believe the Word of the Gospel. Believe the promise of the Gospel that God has given in His Word. Believe that the one who comes to Christ surely will not be cast out. And if you believe, God will forgive you of your sins. All your sins will be pardoned because of the work of Jesus Christ at the cross. And God will credit you with having lived Christ's life. God will impute to your account the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. God will look at you as if you lived Christ's life because He looked at Christ as if He lived your life if you are truly His. Christ takes my sin and I receive His righteousness as a free gift of God's grace, as a free gift of mercy. This is the beauty of the Gospel, that it is all of grace and it is all for the glory of God, for the honor and praise of God. And for the person who is genuinely saved, they will become a new creation in Christ. They will be, as the Bible describes, born again, made new by the working of the Holy Spirit of God in their hearts. They will be a new creation in Christ. Their life will change. Their thoughts, their desires, the intentions of their hearts, it will all change because they have been made new. I can recall that when I was converted by the grace of God, that my life changed radically. That was the evidence that I had truly been saved. That the Father had mercy on me truly. The evidence of that was simply that my life had been changed. And I lived differently. I thought differently. I talked differently. I behaved differently. I was new. I was clothed with power from on high. And friends, this same power from on high that I have been given 
The same Spirit of God who indwells me can indwell you. You must repent and flee to Christ so that you be saved from hell. That you be saved from the wrath of God against your sin. Be saved from this wicked generation, friends. We live in a wicked day and age where sin is celebrated and righteousness is not. Oh, friends, the wrath of God is coming. So believe. Believe upon Christ alone. As it says in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, Let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made Him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. Jesus was crucified for sinners. He is Lord. And this is all to the end that God might be glorified. This gospel message, this great salvation, is all by grace so that God gets all the glory and all the praise and all the honor. And so friends, I exhort you to come to Christ, to give God the glory for the great things that He has done in His Son. He has done great things indeed, great and mighty things has He done for His people. And it is all by grace. All for the glory of God. As 2 Corinthians 13 verse 14 says, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. To the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one in three and three in one. To this God, to the God of glory, be honor and praise forever indeed. Indeed and indeed. So flee to Christ and live, you who are lost. Flee to Christ today. For you who are religious as well, flee to Christ. Repent and believe on Him for eternal life. Or else be eternally lost. And even you, my brethren, you, my fellow Christians, I encourage you to share this gospel, to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with this lost and dying and hopeless world so that they might as well find hope in Christ as we have. All for the glory of God. So we have seen here in Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15, that the law of God is written upon the heart and mind. That people's consciences know right and wrong. They can discern right and wrong. But man chooses to do wrong anyways. And therefore brings upon himself condemnation. But Jesus saves from sin. And therefore all who flee to Him will be saved from their sins and saved from the wrath of God. This is truly the love of God. The greatest manifestation of God's love is the cross of Jesus Christ. To God be the glory indeed forever. In all things, in my life, in your life, in all things, as all things work to that chief end and to that great and glorious end, to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah.